Hey everyone and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. I am Justin, the guy from the next island over, and I'm like, oh, oh shit. I'm Nico, the damned icon. Wow. And I'm Dan, aka him. And we are here today to discuss Apostle. Apostle. Is it Apostle or Apostle? It's, it's Apostle. Upholstery? <laughs> yep. <laughs> here at uh, Select Mattress Warehouse, we have pride in our... No. So we are here today to discuss Apostle, directed by Gareth Evans, who you might know from The Raid and The Raid Redemption. This stars Dan Stevens as Thomas Richardson, Michael Sheen, no relation, as Malcolm Howe, Lucy Boynton as Andrea, and Mark Lewis Jones as Quinn, a.k.a. the biggest dickhead in this whole movie. So the year is 1905. We open with Thomas, a man who has been summoned by his family's estate to help rescue his sister, who was kidnapped by a cult. You see, the cult worships a mysterious goddess and has made their home on an island. Thomas manages to infiltrate the cult, and he arrives on the island. After meeting the three leaders, Malcolm, Quinn, and Frank, he begins looking for his sister. So we're set. He's infiltrated. Lead me on, Nico. What happens? So, while doing some late-night recon, like you do, some sort of old-timey Splinter Cell shit, it's pretty cool, Thomas sees Frank's son Jeremy and Quinn's daughter Fionn returning from a good old late-night fuck. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, audience note, the script says Trist, but I was feeling saucy. The following day... Thomas forces Jeremy to assist him under threat of revealing his illicit relationship with Fionn. Good old blackmail. Jeremy then reveals that Thomas's sister is on the island and that she is, in fact, alive. So Malcolm and the leaders are aware that there's a traitor among us, though. Among them, I guess you could say. Uh, uh. And they organize a festival so that they can search people's room for evidence during the revelry. All right, Dan, this festival is definitely a pretty big deal, right? doesn't really seem like it because they don't spend much time on it. But anyways, at the start of the festival, Thomas has a flirtatious encounter with Andrea, who is Who's Malcolm's daughter. fuck? That too. But his mind, you know, he keeps on task. And with the assistance of Jeremy, he infiltrates a house in pursuit of his sister. Erstwhile, Malcolm oh, and shit. Quinn, two of the leaders, go through Thomas's room and find a map, deducing that he is the spy. They pursue him back to the house, and Thomas flees through an underground tunnel. My favorite kind. So in the tunnel, Thomas meets a kind of supernatural old woman. He flees and winds up in a shoreside cove. The cove has pictures of the kind of the goddess of the island, and he meets Andrea, who gives him a place to hide. While this is happening, we kind of get a little bit of backstory and see that the island is slowly becoming barren, Animals give birth to deform young, and the crops are toxic and not edible. You see, the goddess once blessed this land, but her favor has since ended. Thomas tells Andrea that he used to be a missionary, but he was tortured during the Boxer Rebellion in China, and his faith was subsequently broken. We are then treated to a scene where we see the goddess, trapped in a house, being force-fed blood by Malcolm in an attempt to get her to bless the island. Because when they feed her blood, you know, like little flowers start to bloom around her. So touching, right, Nico? Very much so, except it's extremely creepy. Bad news, though. Fionn's father, Quinn, finds out that she's pregnant and just has the worst possible fucking reaction and finds out that Fionn wants to leave the island with Jeremy. Quinn murders his daughter, which is awful, and Jeremy attacks him. Quinn blames the murder on Jeremy after crying out into the town that, you know, he's covered in blood and, you know, he just, he killed my daughter, get him, manipulating the townsfolk into believing him. And Jeremy runs away to where Thomas is. Jeremy and Thomas are then caught by the guards and Jeremy is, oh boy, he's brutally murdered. I'm sure we're going to talk about that scene. <laughs> This then turns the cult leaders against one another, and Frank runs to the goddess in an attempt to kill her and end the cult. All right. Sir Dan, how does Frank fare in this endeavor? Well, not very well, because unfortunately, he and Malcolm are both shot. Quinn takes Thomas's sister and Andrea and tells them that he will impregnate them and sacrifice their children to the goddess in exchange for her blessing. Thomas has a conversation with the goddess, and sets her on fire as she requests. 
The fire spreads to the village as Thomas heads back to save his sister and Andrea. He manages to save both of them, and together they all kill Quinn, the asshole, but Thomas is mortally wounded. So now Andrea and his sister escape, and Thomas's sister escape with the rest of the village as Thomas is left back on the island. He lies down as Malcolm, who did survive, comes to have a quick conversation with him. As Thomas dies, his body is absorbed by the island and flowers begin to bloom around him. The movie ends with Thomas, who seemingly kind of becomes the new protector of the island. So one super quick note to the audience. That was a fairly long plot synopsis by our standards, and we had to cut out a ton. There is a lot happening in this movie, and just for the sake of time, we couldn't cover all the plot synopsis. But if it at all interests you, you know, you might want to look into it yourself because there's a lot that happens in this movie. But let's kick with our standards, shall we? Nico, visuals in this one. How'd you feel about them? It was absolutely delightful, Justin. Thank you for asking. Honestly, mm. just a treat to see. And you get this with all the Netflix-backed sort of specials, be they miniseries or movies. They usually have some kind of resources available to make everything look just top-notch. And this really, really does. The set design is fantastic. The use of color is great. The costuming and character design are all interesting. And even though there are some of these more barren like i'm not going to get the architectural term right but colonial-esque kind of structures and stuff it still looks like a pretty vibrant community for how small it is there was never a point in the movie where things just looked dull and bland and the fact that there was just so much green in this movie was a real treat i think so that's an interesting point i agree there was a ton of green but one thing I liked is how the film mixed kind of almost natural feeling shots with almost like corrupted is probably the best word I can think of, but just mm -hmm. like the very first shot they show you off the island is super scenic and super beautiful. Yeah. And then we also get shots though of like kind of the underground tunnels, which are almost kind of like the, for lack of a better word, the arteries of the island. It feels alive. Yeah, and they're coursing with this, like, kind of viscous-looking blood. And it's just, eh, disgusting. When Thomas was in the tunnels, I wanted him to close his mouth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dan, what are your thoughts in terms of the visuals? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both of you guys. Though I, I wouldn't quite necessarily call it vibrant. I struggle with that word. I mean, I guess it is, but... To me, it was very natural colors. A lot of greens and browns and things there in the woods and the forests. When I personally think of vibrant, I think of a lot of like brighter color, pinks, yellows, blues, things like that. Sure. Which there wasn't a whole lot of that. So vibrant in the sense of the color grading and things, yes. But it, to me, the setting, the village was a lot of browns and things like that, like wooden structures and stuff. But I agree with the rest of what you said, absolutely. All right, well... Why don't you take charge? Tell me about the audio here. So the music was a lot of cacophony, a lot of strings, and they used a lot of pots and pans and just a lot of different percussion to kind of build. A, there was a lot of like cacophonous buildups, uh, like long 30 second buildups to just a really, I really loud. Those. Yeah, it was pretty cool. A ton of strings, very off putting, very. I don't know, cacophonous is the best word I can think of right now. So a lot of that. All right. As a little side note, you know, because I agree with a lot of what you said, Dan, I like the festival music. I thought it was very fanciful. Mm. I wanted to do a quick little dance myself when that came on. But alas, it was not for I. Nico, anything to add to the music there? Yeah, one thing that I really, really loved about it was its use of microtones, or microtonality, I should say, in the soundtrack. There was a lot of that going on. For context, I was sort of like playing guitar along with the just melodies that were happening, and there were lots of notes in between notes of the normal sort of like 12-note diatonic scale, and that goes a long way towards creating this sense of unease and tension because your ears naturally expect to hear things in the sort of order that 
again, diatonically being like, you know, A to G, we would expect them to, but when things sound just ever so slightly in between and out of tune, it creates just a lot of tension, and I love that. It was really, really well done. I love the sound design in this. All right. So I have a quick question. As we kind of start our discussion of this, sometimes I think the best place to start is often the end. Okay, Tarantino. Dan, I don't like feet. Dan, I want to know, what actually happens at the end there? In your opinion, do you think Thomas has kind of become the new goddess, a.k.a. maybe a god of some variety? Or what do you really think is going on? So before the podcast, before we started, we were kind of talking about it. And I think I'd kind of agree with that statement now that he he kind of becomes the protector or one with the island, I guess. But first, upon initial watch, I thought that his body was becoming nourishment for the island and that, like, the goddess was, I guess, still alive or something. I'm not quite sure. But in the movie, whenever the goddess is fed blood, that is what allows the island to thrive and the plants and animals to thrive. So at the end of the movie, we see the scene of him like dying and the plants around him start to bloom and things like that. So I thought that it was just him feeding the earth. But after we talked about it a while, I, I do kind of see it more as him becoming the replacement goddess because she was killed, she died. And now he is sort of taking over that aspect because earlier in the film she mentions that like he's like the chosen one or she had maybe not chosen but she had been expecting him so i'm thinking that maybe she passed on the responsibility to him all right i pretty much agree with those sentiments dan i wonder if there's not maybe an element of rebirth to that as well i know that in some traditions you know particularly with more kind of pagan you know traditions Rebirth and the cycle of life is a huge, huge, huge thing. And I wonder if maybe, you know, the goddess hadn't become tainted in a way. So he almost kind of was returning her to the land and then giving himself to be the next one. You know, mm -hmm. that's almost kind of a way that I see it as well. But Nico, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. So there are two things that I want to say really quick. One is a shout out to Joseph Campbell, who is the author of like Hero of a Thousand Faces, and he made the framework for how we tend to understand narrative structures a lot in well, many stories. I'm not just going to say Western, but a lot of them. There's sort of like the hero's journey. He was one who came up with that, and there's like the 12 stages of it. And in particular, regarding the ending, there is a stage towards the end where if the hero dies, they will often have a grave on some kind of like hilltop or mountainside overlooking something either metaphorically or literally. And in this case, it was on the sort of the mountaintop overlooking the island. So that scans. But also, I took it more in terms of the symbolism and the sort of the metaphor for what the island was doing for everyone there as opposed to him becoming the god or of whatever of the island. So when you think about what the island was doing for the parishioners or apostles, I guess, the people who were living there, it was a place of refuge. It was a place of respite where they could escape and be safe. And they didn't have to worry about being persecuted or anything. And once Thomas was able to accomplish his goal, get his sister to safety, and see to it that the toxic people of the islands were driven out, he was able to achieve his goal. And he no longer had to worry about, he no longer had to take violence from anyone. He no longer had to worry about any kind of threat. And so he, in a way, even though he died, he still achieved his peace by becoming part of that island. Interesting. So I have a question for you, because I never thought about that at all. Kind of thinking about the toxic people being driven out of the island, everyone leaves the island. So like mm -hmm. everyone flees. So do you kind of think that maybe the toxicity of the people in general just being there, is everyone being driven out, do you think? And like returning the island to its natural state of no people or like nature, I guess? I think somewhat, yes. I think it's more so just the, and this is a theme I imagine we're going to talk about, but did you know power corrupts? 
Mm. So, like, mm-hmm. just given the influence that Quinn had on everyone and the state of, like you were saying, Justin, corruption that had grown in the island, it almost seems just like a, a hard reset kind of thing, like a system restorer. Like, we got to flush out all the impurities except for mm. Thomas because he kind of seemed like a symbolic representative of the islands by causing those events to sort of come to happen. Mm. Okay. And I guess to kind of continue the discussion we're having here, why is this movie called Apostle? Is Thomas, do you think, the apostle of the goddess? Yeah, Dan, what do you think? (laughs) Audience, there was a pause. There was a fucking pause there. (laughs) And see, I've kind of been struggling to come up with that because I've been thinking about that a lot, actually, of like, why was this called Apostle? And I think it does refer to Thomas. And it's interesting because he, as Justin, I think, mentioned during the synopsis, he used to be a firm, very stout, devout Christian. He was a missionary. And he sort of lost religion after he was tortured and everything. So then he comes to this island later on, and him kind of being protector or or whatever may happen, you know, whatever you kind of think happened, either way, it's sort of unanimous that he is, you know, related to the goddess somehow or to the island or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's a very religious sort of ending for him. And I think that kind of ties into the apostle title. And I do think it refers to him. So I took the liberty of memorizing the dictionary definition of apostle. Oh. <laughs> this this is kind of what it says. lies through his teeth right now. <laughs> So there's a couple different things listed here. First is each of the 12 chief disciples of Jesus Christ. Then it says any important early Christian teacher, especially St. Paul. And lastly on here is the first successful Christian missionary in a country or to a people. So I guess I maybe wonder if Thomas thought he was an apostle for Christianity, but he was actually an apostle to maybe the actual people of the island. Like, I think maybe he wasn't supposed to be an apostle to the people of China, you know, where the whole rebellion went down. I think he was meant to be an apostle to the people of the island. Is apostle exclusive to Christianity? It kind of seems like it. Based on the dictionary definition that that I memorized, I feel so. Okay. But I could be wrong there. I'm not a a apostletician. But I will say that You don't want to apostolatize? No. So basically, I think that, you know, he goes to these people who are being swayed by each of the three different leaders, although not so much Frank, because he's just a little fuck. But he's just there. Basically, (laughs) I think he does try to instill very, very, very briefly through his actions, he tries to do the right thing. And I think in particular, it's the sacrifice. He is... I think it's kind of summarized in that end scene where he's like hugging his sister and she was like, I thought you were dead. And he was like, at my lowest point. And it almost sounds like religion almost. Like when he lost his faith, when his faith was broken. It's a really cool scene, you know, because while he's getting tortured, yo, it's metal as fuck. They literally burn a cross onto his back. And while they're doing that, he's like praying for God to come help him. And there's a cross in a field and the cross falls as he's branded. And it almost represents like, you know, his faith, like falling to the ground and becoming crumbled. But he never lost faith in his sister. And he always loved his sister. And he was like, no matter what, I would never let anything happen to you. I am more than willing to give up myself for you. And I think to me, that was almost kind of like a, I don't know, that was almost kind of like a thing there. But again, I could be wrong. It's interesting to posit our theories. Yeah. And and I can't remember exactly what you said a minute ago, but something reminded me of like, a lot of the people on the island trust him very quickly. And that's something I found kind of odd. But I mean, one, Malcolm starts to trust him because Thomas puts his own life in danger to save Malcolm. Uh, But that was to me sort of like, okay, let me try something to get on Malcolm's good side or whatever. But I mean, pretty much right when he gets on the island, Jeremy is like, hey, mister, like, I'm going to be friends with you. And I trust you and with my whole being and, you know, whatever. And then at the end, when he's escaping, the one lady is like, thank you, Mr. Richardson, or whatever his last name is. 
thank you and, and uh, we'll protect. I can't remember exactly what she said, but she like very much trusted him too. I was kind of like, where did this come out of? Like, he's been on the island for like a couple of days and like doesn't talk to anybody or do anything really. But I wonder if that sort of is sort of reference to the apostle theory, I guess, that he's bringing either this island's religion or a new way of thinking or something a more holy, not necessarily religious holy, but more wholesome. Sacred. Yeah, I guess. And I wonder if people can sense that in a weird way. I'm not really explaining it very well, but yeah, I, don't, I hope you know what I mean. But He passed the vibe check just yeah, like uh, instantly. Yeah, I was trying to say uh, that a little bit more professionally, but yeah, he passed the vibe <laughs> check. So, you know, I'm going to go ahead and snatch this apple off the tree here, Nico, and offer it to you. Oh, yeah, I love apples. One of the themes here is definitely religion, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of going off that whole talking point about apostles, what role, please keep your answer to 300 words or less, double-spaced, okay, what okay. would you say is the role of religion in this movie? Particularly when it comes to A, the island's leaders, and B, our protagonist. So I am going to speak somewhat as a cynic here and say that religion is the opiate of the masses, particularly insofar as it's portrayed here. It is a very much unifying factor of the society here. Did the society have a name? I can't remember. I don't know. I don't think it did, but anyway throughout the society they're very rules driven they are unified under a certain sort of like set of rules and they've all memorized their credo and in the scene where dan was talking about where thomas protects malcolm everyone is reciting the credo of their religion as a way to sort of like show their faith kind of like a litmus test to see you know like only the truly faithful would know this kind of thing so i think that just by having a charismatic leader who is able to instill a certain set of structure and dichotomy via this religion and via having it be the route by which they obtain their freedom and their liberty I think that's what the main pr sort of driving force of the religion is here. And I think Thomas acts as a foil to that, both because he is, you know, very much a cynical missionary and he's just in direct opposition to it. So it's more of a sociological thing. But then again, there's also a literal God. So maybe I'm full of shit. So, Dan, I want to kind of call you in here. First, let me get your take on the religion thing, but I also have a kind of different question for you. I was going to say, like you mentioned with respect to the leaders versus Thomas, I think the leaders use religion as a weapon. They like really weaponize it against the rest of the island and use it to control them, kind of like Nico said, opiate of the masses. Whereas Thomas, I think, sort of embodies what religion is supposed to be, I guess, even though he yeah. himself is not religious at this point, but he exemplifies the good qualities of religion and the things that people should follow religion for, if that makes sense. You know, he stays true to his word. He does good things. He sacrifices himself for other people, things like that. And then at the end, we see that, you know, the people who weaponized the religion are gone now. And he is... Would you consider Thomas Christ-like? Um... I never thought about that, but maybe. He does sacrifice himself. He doesn't let himself be drawn in by any kind of temptations, be they bad bitches or champagne wishes. Yeah. He has a very good moral code. He helps out those who need it, and he is a carpenter. Is he? He's a carpenter since when? He does woodworking on the island. Look, I'm, I'm <laughs> grasping the straws here. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. I mean... I guess. See, I think to me where it kind of deviates a little bit from kind of, you know, the kind of big three religions, so to speak, and why I kind of almost appreciate, like I said, the only word I can really place it in is that kind of pagan kind of stuff, really. But I feel like 
the goddess of the island. So she may not herself be a goddess. She may just be a manifestation of the island. And the island may just have manifestations, you know, like mm -hmm. there could be a time where maybe Thomas will end up looking like that woman, right? Mm. And we don't really necessarily know too much about the backstory of her, the goddess, and exactly what really causes, you know, she gets blood or flesh. And then as that sacrifice is given, the island is, you know, fortuitous or whatever. Because I really got the feeling almost of a message of, overtaxed and overworked and just too much because it's almost like she's being force fed at one point by an individual known as the grinder who again in the interest of time we had mm -hmm. to kind of like move past but the grinder is basically kind of like this movie's equivalent of pyramid head and yeah, yeah. like the grinder is at one point in time like force feeding flesh to the goddess and they keep doing it over and over and the goddess clearly doesn't want it anymore and I thought it was interesting because he actually freed her from her servitude, more or less. She was trapped, and then he led people to freedom. Thomas or the grinder? Thomas, Tom not the grinder. Thomas, yeah. The grinder led people to the grinder. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> like, uh. <laughs> so, I don't know. I kind of get that feeling, too, a little bit. But And this was kind of the last, not last, but this is a question that I have for both of you taking our goggles away from religion just temporarily, because again, it's called the apostle. There's going to be a lot of religion here. Freedom. So there's a very interesting conversation between Malcolm and Frank when Frank is like fucking him out and I'm taking my son with me too. And Malcolm's like, don't do it. I need you. This island needs you. We can do this. This is our paradise. And it's interesting because just before that, we see a scene, if you know, like, they tell the people when to work. They tell the people when to go inside. You're not allowed to be out past night hours. You have to follow our rules. You fuck around, you'll get purified, AKA a hole drilled into your fucking head. God. Like, there's all these rules associated, but then bearing in mind that Quinn, Malcolm, and Frank were prisoners. And they had kind of, you know, been thrown into the sea or whatever and found that island. And from there, they grew their little cult or whatever. How do you feel, Dan, about the fact that he's telling him, this is freedom and this is where a, a man can be free, you know? And they're saying all that, but the reality is so sharply different on the island. Why? I mean, I think it kind of tackles the question of what is freedom a little bit. And also, like, the fact that I don't know that, like, 100% true freedom exists. Because if you are part of a society, then you have rules and you have regulations and you have leaders, you have followers, you have workers. So, you know, there is no such thing as like 100% true freedom. And whereas I think freedom also depends on your perspective too. So I think Malcolm and the crew were free from the king and the king's rules and the king's that, but they were the ones who made up these rules. So the islanders, the general people aren't necessarily free of rules and stuff. They're just free of the king's rules. They just traded it for other rules, really. And they don't really talk about it too much in the movie, aside from that conversation, maybe one or two other tiny little things. But it's an interesting take on what is freedom and who is free and perspective of freedom, I think. That's true. It's kind of like getting your own place, but it's in a neighborhood with the homeowners association. <laughs> Goddamn. So... Yeah. I want to kind of, you know, get your guys' opinion real quick. Why do we think the goddess stopped blessing the island? I kind of gave my two cents on it already. I think she gave all she had to give and she needed to be renewed or refreshed or they were just overtaxing her way too much. She needed to be free, not chained up. I mean, those are kind of my feelings on it. Nico, why did the goddess stop blessing the island? I think she saw the evil of man, specifically those three men. <laughs> I was going to ask you, is this man capital M? Or like, man. No, I think it's those three in particular, and also whoever made the grinder, which like, God, <laughs> I would, I would watch a movie solely dedicated to the grinder. Mm -hmm. the character design for him is so fucking cool, so threatening. But I really think it's just the, like I was saying, the power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
in, you know, again, like you said, these are prisoners and they made their own rules. And I think they got a little too headstrong with it. And, you know, whoops. So you formed a cult. <laughs> Let's talk about it. All right. All right. Now, I guess almost kind of playing off your words there. Who is the true? First off, who are the good people in this movie to you, Dan? I'm going to go ahead and say, for one, Thomas. I think he is a good person. I also think, as unfortunate as it is, I think also, like, Jeremy and Fionn both represent good. Yeah. But I think there's almost a difference between, and maybe those two, I might group them more under the category of innocence yeah. rather than good. But Innocent more than righteous. Yeah, I guess so. So, Dan, let me rephrase my question. Who is righteous? I would say Andrea. Aside from the people you mentioned, I think that's about it. I don't really think there's too many others. Malcolm, see, I go on and off with Malcolm. I guess he's a bad guy, but he pales in comparison to Quinn, I think. I think Quinn overshadows the badness because Malcolm, I think, he's lawful neutral. I guess like he has his code of honor, I guess that he follows for the most part, but Quinn mm -hmm. just says, fuck all this and I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want and fuck everyone else. So Nico, I want to get more in terms with you on the three leaders here. Is Frank evil? Do you consider Frank to be evil or do you consider him to be neutral? What does he say? I think he's a coward. Frank's a coward. I agree. I think he's just trying to get his and do what he can to protect his own. It seemed like he was along for the ride more than anything else, really. I didn't sense necessarily an evil bone in his body. I feel like he was just part of the crew, and so he got in with the rest of them. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go ahead and turn to Malcolm. Dan already kind of gave his two cents there about Malcolm a little bit. Do you see Malcolm as evil? Do you see him as misguided? How do you see Malcolm? I think his intentions originally were good. Like I said, I think just being a de facto ruler of an island really got to his head. I don't know at what point he founded the religion de Malcolm, but I think it could have been a much more peaceful society, a much less volatile society if there wasn't this sort of sense you know i am the chosen one like maybe if he hadn't found the goddess or that woman maybe things would have been better see i think it's interesting because I almost kind of feel like again i keep going back to this point harping on it like an instrument but i feel like they basically try to twist or corrupt christianity a little bit into their yeah. own religion they kind of yeah. cliff noted it and in that sense Malcolm, oh shit, was Malcolm the apostle? But they basically made it so he was like, remember at the start he says, she only speaks through me, wink. And like, I mean, she's not speaking to anyone right now. They got her chained up with the grinder. But like, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where I wonder about it because you're right in that if the society had maybe been more, a little more egalitarian, but again, the year was 1905. You know, so a lot of stuff was going on I don't know. You have Andrea, who is... They acknowledge her talents as a doctor because as soon mm -hmm. as Thomas is hurt, they immediately go to her and they're like, fix it. Yeah. And But she really... At least we get the idea that the women on the island are kind of kept to quote-unquote women's work and that's just kind of how it is. So I wonder if they hadn't been a little... Not so Old Testament with the whole thing <laughs> if things might not have turned out a little bit better. Probably. But last one up on the table here, Quinn. Now, the lens I want to look at Quinn through really is that power corrupting thing. Do you believe Quinn was always a bad person or is he the personification of corruption here? I think he's an evil motherfucker. Yeah. And Start to I finish. hated him. Start to finish. Okay. He was a fantastic villain and... I can't think of the last time that I really, truly, viscerally hated a villain this much. Yeah, he was a real piece of fucking work there. Yeah, he was the one who captured and enslaved the goddess, too. He said he's he the one who he figured out her powers and captured her. 
So I wonder if Malcolm or Frank, if they had been the ones to figure out or had opposed Quinn and let her, you know, be maybe not totally autonomous or free, but rather than literally chaining her up and, and force feeding her blood and flesh, if they were a little bit nicer about it, I wonder if their things would have gone different. Now, I have a cool question for you guys. And this is typically something that we discuss at, you know, the start of episodes, but we were having such fun. So I do want to know, what kind of horror is this? At the end of the day, taking into account everything we know, what category of horror would you put this in? You know, is this like supernatural? How do you find this? Yeah, Dan, how do you find this? This is the big P. I think it's... Big P. Yeah. Nico, what's the big P, Nico? The big P is, of course, prestige horror. Round of, round of applause in the room, everybody, for prestige horror. Now, I do want to say once again <laughs> that I don't really know how I feel about labeling it like that, but I feel like I have to. I feel like I have to. Everything down to the cinematography, the elements of drama. We've discussed it on the podcast from here till tomorrow. It is what it is there. But I was talking with Sir Dan, you know, yesterday, and my personal feeling is I think this movie would be better as a series, actually. Something akin to hmm. Bly Manor, for example. Only because I feel like there's so many different plot lines in this movie that kind of come and go type deal. And it's like, for example, the whole pregnancy storyline. That could have been really cool if it had been something that had been teased out over a couple episodes. You know, kind of like that impending announcement being held over the audience for a couple episodes. Or even, you know, like looking for the sister, the introduction of the grinder and the goddess. I personally, and I mean, the movie's already like a tall drink of water at two hours and about 10 minutes. But it was two hours and 22 minutes. It might have been two hours and 22 minutes. I might have just been hallucinating. It's fucking long, but the pacing's fantastic. The pacing is good, but I feel like in exchange for that pacing, I think there are some plot points that get dropped. Another Certainly. one, in my opinion, is we kind of start out with Thomas being a little bit addicted to his liquid joy, we might say. And drugs, not that alcohol. gets dropped. But yeah. Yes, drugs, drugs. Some kind of like pain tincture to get him to help him sleep or something. I think it's liquid cocaine or no. opium, some kind of opioid type joint. But that would make sense if it was opium. Religion, the opioid of the masses, but opium is also the opioid like of the boxer apostle. Boxer rebellion just checks a lot of boxes. Damn it. Yeah, <laughs> I saw what you did there. <laughs> Dan, your thoughts on this being a series? I agree 100% with you. Like you said, there's... I was thinking about it in the whole pregnancy thing with Jeremy and Fionn. That's what leads to, like, the split between the three leaders of the cult, and, like, that's what really sets everything off. But I think there's only like four scenes in the whole movie with them. After four scenes, like yeah. Fionn's dead, Jeremy's got his head cut open, like that's it. And then thinking about, like you mentioned with Jeremy finding his sister, the whole like first 10 minutes of the movie are like, okay, you have to go find your sister. He gets to the island and he finds her. Like pretty immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and, or like he at least sees her anyways. And then, like, 20 minutes later, he finds Malcolm her. Malcolm fucking brings her out in the open, like, yeah. hey, here she right. is. And it's like, when I think about, like, every plot point that happens, everything only has, like, maybe four scenes. But there's just so much. Like, it's a two hours and change. But there's just so many different plot points. And I totally agree. I think a miniseries would have been cool, you know, seven, eight episodes or something that really kind of dives a little bit farther into those and gives more time for those events to ruminate and really explore those relationships. And I think it would have been a little bit more effective that way. All right, all right. Now, Nico. Yes. I have a very, very specific question for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. It's time for what would you do? So I want to know, you are Thomas. Okay. Right? First off, who amongst the three of us is getting kidnapped by a cult? You. Justin. It's me. It's, it's you. It's me. It's me. <laughs> All right. So, Dan, you and Nico get word that Darius, Dan, and Nico, you bitch made tricks. We get, we get word, <laughs> Dan and Nico. Your boy, Justin. There Joss. you are. 
That would be some kind of fucking letter. It's just like, how fucking ominous would that be? You get a letter, you open it up, there you are. I would shit my pants. <laughs> but no, I was just like, all right, guys, this is what it is, yo. I went to go scout out this joint for a podcasting location, but I got kidnapped by this cult. Lols, my bad. So look, they told you to bring a ransom, but we don't negotiate with terrorists. So, but nah, like real talk, I was like, yo, come to the island and save my ass, bro. And don't save me like that one movie, Dark Water, where that chick did not save anyone. Like, for real, for real, save me. <laughs> Fucking no one. <laughs> so, for real, for real, save me. So, y'all at least get on the boat and come to the island. And, you know, you kind of, like, infiltrate the cult a little bit. I'm going to take you guys to the night of the funeral. You have a little Jeremy there. He's like, yeah, I seen Justin. He was freestyling in that basement over there last I saw him. <laughs> so, what would you do when the cult members are, like, pursuing you and you get trapped in the tunnels and whatnot? Probably Andrea. Mm. Good answer. My rescue ends with Andrea for Nico. Dan, <laughs> how about you? See, I think you skipped a critical step. Because if I received a letter from you that says, yo, I oh, got shit, kidnapped, I, I would have been like, nah, you trolling, bro. <laughs> Let me keep playing Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> like, <laughs> bro, like, I'm sorry, but you would have to send me like 10 letters and I wouldn't have to see you for like two years before I'd be like, all right, this man might be actually be kidnapped. <laughs> all right. Next letter, no dead ass, yeah. though. <laughs> It'd be like letter four or five where like, no, fuck you, bro. Come save me. I'd be like, all right, fine, <laughs> shit. This is not a bit. I'd be like, Dan, nah, for real, the cult is kind of getting mad now. They don't believe me when I tell them I'm a troll. <laughs> and that's why you don't believe me. But here's another question. So you discover the goddess and she's like, kill me, set me free or whatever. Would you kill her? Would you set her on fire like that? Yeah. No question. At first, I would sample her because that'd be dope to put on a track. Wow. Oh, I, yo, 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 yo. When you said you were going to no, sample her. No, not some her? Jekyll and Hyde shit. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, I thought you were going to like eat her or something like that. <laughs> I will gain oh, your power. No. <laughs> like, oh, no, I, no. I don't know. Like when you sample some food, what do you do? Yeah, okay. When I sample a record, I eat the beat, right? Nah, once again, another music reference. But no, so. <laughs> That's crazy, yo. That's crazy. And That's I guess crazy. to close it off, do you think Thomas made pretty much the right choice every time? Actually, yeah. I kind of think so. With the exception of leaving the map out in the open, but... Oh, yeah. Well, that wasn't out in the open. It was just in a drawer kind of like poking out, and I guess you got to fuck up at some point. But yeah, I can't think of any big flaw. That was a rookie move, but like literally letter to the audience... If you need to hide something, stick it in your drawers. No one is going to be going in your drawers like that. And if someone is going in your drawers, you have no chance. Like, you were never going to win. So Wait, your drawers or your go. drawers? The ones you put clothes in or the clothes on you? That you are in. <laughs> That's called your draw, right? Your drawers. The furniture? Because the drawers I know are the ones you wear, bro. <laughs> Yeah, you wear drawers, like it's your right, drawers. Right, Is that what you're saying? Is that what you yeah. mean? There's no other drawers. Okay. You put your kukri in your drawers? Because Nico was talking about the drawers. No, definitely not. <laughs> nah, Nico talking about the furniture drawers, and you're talking about drawers. I just want to make sure you mean drawers and not drawers. That's all. He means your armoire. I actually do have an armoire, though. Anyways, so <laughs> it's time, y'all. It's time. This movie is sitting at... Oof. We've got a 79%. This is not my credit score. I can't round up. 79% from the critics here on Rotten Tomatoes and a 54% audience score. Wow. wow. Audience may not have been feeling this one 100%. So I want to get your score and just your last thoughts, really. Nico, what's this movie to you? This movie was a treat and we haven't really talked about it so much as of yet on this episode because like justin said there's a lot to talk about and we're not going to be able to cover all of it but just really quick the violence in this movie oh my god it was just gut-wrenching i was actually uncomfortable watching some of the scenes and I think it's really cool that the director worked in, you know, action movies with a bunch of fight scenes before. And I think you can sort of like tell in the limited combat that we have. But 
Having said that, I am a complete slut for prestige horror, as Lizards of the Pod will know. This is my bread and butter. I absolutely love this shit. I think it might be eclipsing psychological horror for me. <laughs> I'm going to give this a 91. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From my perspective, I'm going to give this one an 82. Now, my rationale behind it is as follows. I liked the movie. I liked it overall. I like its attempt to do different things. It is original, and I got to give it its credit where it's due. From my perspective, I sometimes feel like some of the plot points were a little unfocused, and I think if they had maybe focused in or reined in a couple of them and really stuck with just a couple plot points that they considered to be the most important ones, we might have seen a better final product come out of it. The ending I really liked. I thought that was a great ending to the movie, though. And a lot of times movies kind of shit the bed with their ending. But this one was great. So as I said, this one gets it. You know what? You know what? No, not an 82. I lied. This is going to get an 84 for me. Dan, thoughts? I'm going to give this a 73. My reasoning is as follows. I like a lot of the concepts, kind of like what Justin said, actually. I like a lot of the concepts. I like that they tried a lot of things. But for me, it just didn't quite hit. There were parts where I thought sometimes the violence and the horrific things were just thrown in there to be violent or horrific. And sometimes I didn't quite see like a point to them almost. There were some plot points that I didn't quite understand. And now going back and like thinking on them and discussing them, I'm like, okay, I kind of get it. But sometimes the reasoning behind character actions or the island or the goddess or things just didn't quite make sense to me or didn't make enough sense. And like we said with the miniseries kind of conversation, I think that The director tried to do too many things in too short of a period of time. But I still applaud it on the technical level, the audio and the visuals, and, you know, what they tried to do and everything. So 73 for me. You know what? Dan is too goddamn right. I changed my score to an 80. Wow. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Okay, fucking flip-flopping. I will say also, I agree with literally everything you both said. This just hits different for me because I love this shit. No, I and feel that. that's the kind of thing that you're going to get when you're listening to a podcast of three different people. Like, we each have our own different likes and dislikes and shit. And that's what you're coming here for because we're fucking delightful. And you know it. That's fucking true. There's definitely movies that, like, we've watched on here that I'm just like, I see and understand the flaws, but I fucking love it anyways, you know, so... So, guys, before we uh, bring this one to a cease, would you recommend this one to the audience? I say yes. I say yes. I'm going to say yes as well. Now, I'm going to say no on the Golden Seal for me, personally. I'm also going to say no, which might surprise the two of you, because, like I said, I agree with everything y'all said. I just really fuck with this. And for something to get the Golden Seal for me, it has to, like, really rise above. And it's almost there for me, but not quite. Mm. Mm-hmm. Dan, I'm going to assume it's a no from you oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, it's definitely a no from me. All right, then. So that's been it from us here. I don't open that door. Dear listener, as always, you know, we ask that you don't join cults. But if you do and want to tell us about it, drop us a line. We're on Twitter and Instagram at DOTD Horror. And send multiple notes or we might not think you're real. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> and we're on Facebook. Don't open that door. So, yeah, that's it from your cult here, Dan, Nico, and Jess. Keep yourself safe. And as always, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye. Bye.